Thank you guys for coming back on time for this. So I like John Paul's philosophy of not holding people over time before lunch. And I believe the corresponding philosophy is to give people a couple extra minutes at lunch. So thanks for bearing with us while we get started a little after the, the designated time. So get ready, we're gonna talk about some very exciting material, the intake procedures and assessment in PCIT. Um, so we've already been talking about PCIT and why it is it can be distinguished so importantly from other approaches. Um, and so what I'm really gonna focus on is this final point about how PCIT is so assessment driven. And we're gonna talk about those main pieces specifically the required assessment procedures um, that are really fundamental to how the treatment works, and then also the assessment instruments that are strongly encouraged. And you've already heard a bit about the rationale, but we're gonna talk about semi-structured interview, and I'm sure you all have sort of your approach in your organizations for how you run an interview, and we're just gonna talk about some of the important details that you wanna make sure you include as part of your initial evaluation. You are hearing about this mysterious ECBI um, that we talk about, the Iberg Child Behavior Inventory, and the mystery will be revealed in just a few minutes. Um, you've heard about the dyadic parent-child interaction coding system, the DPIX, and Melanie is gonna talk about that even more later, and it promises to be very exciting. And then the strongly encouraged, and I say very strongly encouraged, I was urged by my colleagues to sort of move this off the required list, but the strongly encouraged um, assessment measure that measures or the Sutter Iberg Student Behavior Inventory, that's the classroom based um, evaluation measure, and the TAI, the Therapy Attitude Inventory that we'll talk about. So you can keep this in mind and we'll go into each in more detail. The key to any good, solid, comprehensive evaluation for a child and their family is to have an assessment with breadth, breadth of informants, of methods, of settings. So you wanna make sure that you are getting data from a child's parents, from the child's teacher, and when possible and when indicated, a trained observer who can go into, for example, the classroom and get a sense of what the interactions are like between the caregiver or teacher and the child. For disruptive behavior disorders, for something like ODD, oppositional defiant disorder, you only have to establish a certain number of symptoms and impairment in one setting to make the diagnosis. But it's still important to understand if there's, if there's impairment in school, if there's impairment on the soccer field, if there's impairment in other areas. So you get a sense of how urgently you have to act in those or how long you can wait to see do the effects generalize based on the evidence that there is carryover. For something like ADHD, you have to establish impairment in at least two settings. So you can't make a diagnosis of ADHD unless you have input from, let's say, the teacher or some other sort of caregiver in that setting. And the reason why we focus mostly on um, diagnoses isn't so much for the label, it's really to make sure, again, you did this great exercise on appropriate populations, we want to make sure that this particular treatment is what's actually indicated, that it's not too intensive or that it's not, um, you know, that a different treatment isn't actually indicated. We also use multiple methods, so it's really important to get very solid background information and to do your interview. Rating scales, and we'll talk about the important rating scales that you wanna make sure that you include. And like I said, direct observation. So the trick about direct observation is that it can be really, really useful, and it's a fundamental part of research studies because you need somebody who's not biased. You know, they go into the classroom and they're masked potentially to whether or not a child has gotten the treatment or not. The hard thing about direct observation is that um, you don't always see the behavior you're going to see. So it's important, but you wanna make sure you have these other um, these other, the rating scales, the interview, um, to really ensure you know, diagnostic accuracy. 
And of course, multiple settings, because you want to know how pervasive the problems are that you're helping with, the difficulties. So you want to know, you know, is this really, is this child struggling mainly at home? Is this something that, you know, is preventing their parent coming on public transportation to get them to sessions? How are we going to, uh, you know, address that um, and in school and in other areas? So repeated measurement is key in PCIT. You're always collecting data to inform your practice. So at the pretreatment, there's that important intake procedure, the interview that you do, and you're collecting information, the rating scale data, using the ECB, the CESB, when you have any concerns about school behavior problems. And then the DPICS baseline that Melanie talked about earlier is how you get an assessment of the quality of parent-child interactions. So how much warmth there is, how, what this limit setting is like, whether the parent does follow through, how much the child escalates when presented with limits, how often is the child getting positive attention for positive behaviors. Then before each session, you, we also give what's the ECB and I usually ask this. Am I allowed to ask questions of the audience while we're, while we're taping? Yeah, I can? OK, thank you. So why do you think we would give the ECB before the session starts? So we want the parents to show up. And some people even say it's like the ticket into session. We want them to rate their child's behavior for the past week. Why before we even sit down with them? So to get a baseline, yes. And then what about after the second session, you know, the third session in? Why would we do it then? Yes, so this is exactly, it's going to be a measure of how effective treatment was. But what's so important is that we don't want to influence the ratings by discussion or by any of the questions that we ask. So if we start talking about the homework and the homework that went really well, that could influence the parents' ratings. Or if the homework didn't go so well, um, you know, and, and they start to highlight that one particular incident or some other incident where the child was really disruptive, we also might get an inflated rating. So we want this to be this unbiased measure of what the past week has been like. And then in each session, we also, in almost every session, we do a DPIX observation to get a sense of the parent-child interactions and what skills we want to be working on mostly that session. And at the end of treatment, we also we want to get a measure of where the ECB is, where the child's behavior is, um, if there's been any change in school functioning, if there were problems to begin with. The TAI will be our measure of consumer satisfaction, so how satisfied the parents are with the content, with the process of treatment. And then also, in research studies in particular, getting a post-treatment DPIC. So we see what are compliance rates like relative to pre-treatment, what's the rate of positive verbalizations, and so on. So I don't have to tell you this, but it's good to review that the parent interview is very useful for providing information about the, the family background. Um, this is where you already start to tailor your treatment. When you start to get a sense of what are the potential barriers that could be keeping this family um, from coming, that type of information. You want to get a history of the child behavior problems, and you want to get a sense of the family structure. Who's around in the mornings? Who's around in the evenings? Who else is in the home? Who might be there to be an additional support for this treatment? Who might be uh, undermining this, the, this treatment? You also want to get a sense of discipline strategies. We, we spend some time in my organization, we spend some time assessing specifically parenting practices. So we go through to get a sense of how much do you agree with praise? How much do you think you use it? Um, you know, what else have you tried? What's, what's your experience been like with time out? And this information lets us know what they've tried in the past in terms of treatment, if they've been an individual, you know, if the child has been in individual therapy for two years and they haven't seen any changes, it's on us to sort of explain to them why this is different, why this is an evidence-based treatment, and why we expect to see the changes that we do and what's the evidence behind that. We also get a sense of, you know, what they've tried and what's worked for them and what hasn't. So almost no family I've ever worked with has ever said, I have used time out and we love it. It really works, <laughs> right? So that's not what we hear. We always hear, I've tried time out and it doesn't work. Or I've never tried time out, I know it won't work with my child. 
And then if you ask a couple more key questions and you do this really important functional analysis, you find out, okay, so, you know, I was going to, I told her she needed to put her socks on. She kept screaming. And finally, I just decided socks aren't worth it. She went without socks. So what happened in this situation? Yes, the child escalated and the parent backed off. And so what we are learning already is the child has just been negatively reinforced. In other words, the demand, which was a negative experience for the child, was taken away when she escalated enough. And so that's important for us to know because that's exactly the type of interaction pattern that we are trying to change. And of course, this is the part of, you know, this is essential where you're building rapport and you're building trust with these families. You're showing genuine concern, empathic understanding. We talk about this a lot in my organization at the Child Mind Institute, we just recently installed these locks on the top of the door on the outside um, that are high out of reach and only we use them when families are in session because it is not uncommon for kids to flee, right? <laughs> to flee from an office. And we are in, a, we, our organization is located, it's an entire city block of New York City. And so if a child flees, you use up the session potentially trying to find him. So anyway, we have these locks that we've just installed that I can't believe we didn't think of it sooner. It's amazing. And every parent that comes in says, you did this for my child. You got these locks for my child, right? No, we got these because this is what we're used to. Um, you know, we, this is when, when families that we see are used to or accustomed to having people give up on their kids or quit on them or quit on their kids. And what we like to do is show this is exactly what we're used to. Um, I have a colleague who says, three bites and you're in. <laughs> so the interview allows you to get more information about the primary concerns to really start to develop a behavior problem list. And this is important because you actually use this later. So I have a family where one of the major concerns coming into treatment was that the child was getting into trouble for teasing. And I said to them, we don't get to that first, but I promise we will get to that. And by the time in treatment, and you'll, you'll, as you learn more, you'll understand later in treatment is when we got to this, later in PDI, and I brought it back up. First of all, the child had really reduced the teasing. But I said, remember when we first talked about teasing? Oh, yes, we definitely should really you know, make sure we address that. They feel heard, right? And you're actually remembering the important and using it in your treatment. So developmental history, medical history, family history, you want to get that family history because if you have a child with ADHD, it's pretty likely that you'll have a parent or another caregiver who has ADHD. So how can that affect your sessions? How might that affect your treatment? So I'll tell you how it might affect your treatment. <laughs> <laughs> so they might forget their homework sheets. Right? And they might not bring you what they've spent a lot of time doing. They might lose track of the exact start time to session, or they might come late. And this could be explained by lots of different reasons. But the more information you have, the more you're, in, you know, you're able to help them have success with the program. School history, social history, I said parenting practices, you want to know what their experiences have been like before. Um, treatment goals, expectations, opinions, are they coming and expecting to drop off their child and that they're gonna, their child is going to be an individual? Because it's on you to believe in, to understand, and to convince them why this is different, why they're going to be involved in every session, and why you're actually going to be in a different room. And that's actually going to be what's most helpful and to assess any other concerns. So here is the mystery revealed. The Iberg Child Behavior Inventory is the key parent report measure of child disruptive behavior. And it's 36 items, and there is an intensity scale and a problem scale. So it's items like whines, refuses to obey unless threatened with punishment, dawdles in getting dressed, steals. So you can imagine. At Lots of disruptive behaviors, and families rate them one to seven from never to always, how often they're happening. And then, and this is key, I review this even though it may seem obvious, whether or not how often that behavior happened this past week is a problem. Sometimes parents get confused and they say, of course whining is a problem. 
Yes, every behavior on this measure is a problem. That's why it's on this measure. The question is, how often it happened this past week? If it happened only, you know, rarely or seldom, then it may not be a problem. For some parents, it may still be if it happens at all. And then you get a sense right there, you're getting important information about that parent's tolerance um, and style. Um, but that's a key distinction. So we, as a review, we administer this before treatment, before every session, and then after treatment. And actually, it's been used, the ECBI has been used in some of those follow-up studies to see where families are rating their child's behavior once treatment has ended. In our organization, we actually call parents at three, six, nine months, 12 months, and then annually thereafter to see where their ECBI falls relative to their post, you know, their graduation session based on data that families maintain their gains. So the ECB provides meaningful data about the child's disruptive behavior outside the clinic at home. Um, it's a measure of parents' distress, that problem scale, yes or no, if these behaviors are a problem. How clinically distressed are these families? It gives you feedback about how therapy is going, if there's actual, you know, if there's treatment um, progress, because you expect to see scores decreasing. Um, and it helps you then make decisions. So, you know, you, if you target teasing in one session, the next week, once you implement that, was there a change? You would expect to. And if there is not, then that lets you know, okay, we have to figure out what was going wrong, what got in the way, were you able to practice, how can we refine how you were doing this technique. So strong psychometric properties, which you can see more about or read more about at PCIT.org. And then this graph just gives you some information comparing families who dropped out of treatment prematurely and their scores carried forward and then the compared to completers. So what we know about the data, and when we look, 100 is around 96 to 100 is right around what's the <coughs> average for kids this age. And then 132 and above is the clinical cutoff. Um, and 114 is where families graduate once they meet this and a couple of other criteria. But so what you can see is that over time, there's a very significant decrease. And what I like to tell my families is disruptive behavior is a good place to be below average. That's the one place you want to be <laughs> below average. So the CESPI is the teacher report measure of disruptive behavior at school. So there are 38 items, and these correspond to classroom. You know, verbally insults classmates, or refuses to obey the teacher until threatened. Um, behaviors that are really specific to the school <coughs> setting. But it's this, the same way it's set up. There's an intensity scale to get a sense of how often the behaviors are happening, and how problematic or distressing they are to the teachers. And we do this before and after treatment. This is one of the strongly encouraged. Um, and this is really important because it's useful information. Now, the challenge with this SB is that you know, it depends on where you start treatment. So I have a child who, last year when I started working with him, his SB was a 182. And if you picture that graph, even though the SB is normed a little bit differently, but it was pretty high up. So we just did a SESB at follow-up, and it's an 82. It's a 100-point drop, and that's really good. The con round is it's a different teacher. But all other data suggests that this kid is doing so, so much better. Um, so it's useful to get that measure. So like I said, important information about disruptive behavior in class, about the teacher's distress, and that's important because you want to know how urgent are the disruptive behaviors in the classroom. So if they're significant, but the teacher can hold off, in some cases, you don't have to initiate a whole nother treatment that's a whole nother expense for the families um, based on the hypothesis that these gains might generalize to the classroom setting. And in fact, that's what we're looking for. How much do the gains generalize? So strong psychometric properties, and this is just to give you some useful information about pre-post in the SESB, the data that we have, with that red line being right around the clinical cutoff, and with the norms, so you see pretty significant improvements in the SESB based on the, the Funderburk study. Melanie is going to talk a lot more about the DPICs, but this is, like I said, a direct observation of the quality of the parent and child interactions. And so, 
among the things that can be coded, the categories that can be coded are verbalizations by the parent, verbalizations by the child, physical touch, vocalizations, uh, and clinically, the ones that you'll be hearing about are verbalizations by the parent, like how often they label praise their child, or how often they're sarcastic or negative with their child, and looking at child responses. So if they listen to a co command, if they don't listen, if their parent gave them a chance to listen. So I'm gonna go through these quickly because we're getting, we're running out of time. But all of these graphs are moving in the expected direction where the skills we wanna see improve, improve, and the behaviors that we wanna see go down, go down. And then this is alpha compliance. This is how kids are responding, how compliant they are to their parents' directives. You can see at post what a significant increase and that they're maintained a year and two years later that these kids are really maintaining their gains. And here for physical negative, that, that means like a, a verbal negative, so something sarcastic or critical, or a physical negative, like the child grabs a toy from the parent and the parent grabs back. Uh -huh. And so it's a harsh interaction. You see that significant decrease and that huge effect size that Dan was talking about earlier. And finally, the TAI, which is available on PCIT.org, um, is a 10-item measure where parents can fill out whether or not, you know, regarding techniques of discipline, I feel I have learned nothing, something, very much, and they can rate um, how they, what their experience was like. Um, and you can see that, you know, that families who complete treatment, so that's the key detail, families who complete treatment are very satisfied with it, and they continue to be satisfied with it one and two years later. So we're going to do a quick, do we have time for a quick, ECB scoring task. Okay. So I'm going to pass out three sample, so two sample ECBs and one sample CESB um, for people to get a chance to score. I'm going to tell you how to score it. Um, this back here. So just take one. Just take one so that everybody, we can try to see if everybody has a chance to um, practice scoring it. So these are make-believe ECBs, so they're not actually, there's no protected health information, just so you know. And so the way that you score them and it's done the same way on the ECB and the CESB, is you're going to add up these numbers and fill in the sum, the total, of the frequency items down here. So you add up all the 7s, 6s, 5s, 4s, 3s, 2s, and 1s, and fill that number in in the left box. Then you count up. So that's the intensity scale, page 1. Then you add up the number of yeses, and that's in the right column, and that's the, the start of your problem scale. Okay, so you can start adding them up. This is what you have to do in session. You get really good at adding these up. I'm out now. Yeah. If your neighbor has one and you could share with your neighbor or have them double check, it'll really simulate what it's like to have a co-therapist where you can <laughs> hand it off and say, check my math or vice versa. So share the, share the love of the ECBI, the ECBI love. So then when you turn to page two, same thing, but only you transfer the, the numbers from page one. So see where it says page one subtotals? You turn to page two, and you write those subtotals from page one. You write the sum from page one for the intensity scale and for the problem scale, and then you sum these. So who has Sarah Smith? What is your total for Sarah Smith? Hmm? 
for the int yes, yes. So your total is going to be the sum of both pages for the intensity and the problem scale. I have a question. Yes. Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up. That was my trick. Woohoo! <laughs> so that comes up a lot. And it's not, it, it, the importance is that you're looking at these and you're really using the information for only children. Um, or if there's only one child in the home, sometimes parents will skip that item um, or write NA. But one is actually, since one is never, that's accurate. You know, do they fight with their sibling? <laughs> never, because they don't have one. Okay, so anyone want to say what the total is for the intensity scale of Sarah Smith? 105. Yes. And does anybody remember what I said was around the mean? It's okay if you don't. Yeah, it was right around 100. So 100, you can go to your handy manual and look up the conversion to see where this falls, if this is a family that meets criteria. Um, and so you can look and you can say she's at a 105 and that's about a T-score of 52. 50 is, you know, the mean. So this is a low ECB. Um, what about the problem scale? 13. So a 13, on the other hand, is a T-score of a 58. So that's almost, that's approaching 60. So this is a parent who's more distressed, who's pretty distressed, even though the behavior is pretty close to average. That's useful information for you. So just because I know we're running out of time, what about Sally Doe? Yes. Did anyone have anything different, or is my math wrong? Huh? 166, going once, going, I have 176. 176. All right, see why it's good to share with your co-therapist and say double check my math. Yes. So I have 176 and 26. And so 176 is a T-score of 73 which 60 and above is the clinical cutoff, so that's pretty high. And then a 26 is a T-score of 75. So this is a pretty impaired kid. All right, so Sally Doe definitely could use some PCIT. What about Thomas Henry, our final, our final exercise? Thomas Henry. 176. 176, okay. Anyone? Anyone? I have 184. I have 184 too. Sold. 184. And what about problem score? 22. So the norms are different, so the numbers don't match up exactly with like the CESB and the ECB. So in the classroom, a 184 is a T score of 66. So that's still pretty high. That's still in the clinically significant range but just keep in mind that the means are different. And a 22 is a T-score of 63. All right, and that closes our exciting exercise with the ECB and the CESB. Now we get to talk about observing the parent-child interaction. The most fun you'll have all day. <laughs> um, and specifically, we're gonna be talking about the dyadic parent-child interaction coding system. As you can imagine, that's a mouthful. So from now on, we'll call it the DPIX, okay? And there's two versions of the DPIX, and, and we're gonna be focusing on the clinical version, but there's also a research version, and, and it, it, it includes more codes and more detail in terms of the, the coding guidelines. Um, and it's really included um, for, for research purposes where you want more detail as to what's going on the clinical version is streamlined for clinicians that are working with families on a, on a regular basis. Um, it includes the codes that are most relevant for PCIT um, and for the practice of PCIT. Um, it's simplified a little bit. In research, you oftentimes have the luxury of videotaping the parent-child interaction. You can pause it. You can rewind it. You can listen to it again. You don't have that luxury in session. They keep talking whether or not you figured out what code to assign them or not. So, 
in a way, it's nice that it's a little bit simpler for us to make those decisions when we're, when we're working clinically and live. Um, and in the clinical version, the child verbalizations are not coded. Um, and that decision was made based on the fact that, that um, for the most part, in research studies, the child verbalizations don't really change all that much from pretreatment to post-treatment. We're not targeting child verbalizations or the amount that they're talking. Um, but also because that adds a whole other level of complication in terms of when you're trying to code, especially trying to code the verbalizations of three to six year olds, some of whom have speech difficulties, some of whom have language difficulties. It can be a real big challenge to try and code those, those verbalizations. So don't have to worry about those. And in this presentation, I'm really going to be focusing on the clinical version of the DPICs and the, um, the codes that are associated with that. Now, why do we code? Why do we do this? And, and uh, sometimes people <laughs> will say, you know, I really like PCIT, but this whole coding thing is too much for me. So why do we do something that, that even a small minority of people find aversive? Um, the, the reason that we, we do it is because it gives us a great way of assessing the, the type and quality of the interaction between the parent and the child. It gives us a way to assess that so that we can see the changes that, we're, that are being made um, it allows us to determine our coaching goals in each session. We watch. It's not the parent saying, oh, well, you know, I think I'm pretty good at label praises, so why don't we work on reflections today? It's us watching, looking at what the parent's doing. Oh, yeah, they're, they are doing lots of label praises. Maybe it would be a good idea to, to focus on something else. Or, no, they said they were really good at label praises, but in fact, they weren't doing label praises, so we need to work more on that, um, those sorts of things. So we have actual data to guide what we're doing in coaching that week. Um, and what I really love about it is that it allows us to give parents feedback on the skills. It, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a different thing from saying, you know, you were doing a really great job praising him. I, I think you just need to praise him a little bit more. Between that kind of feedback and you had six label praises, I want you to get to 10. Parents get the numbers in a concrete way that they don't get when we just say, oh, do that a little more. Um, and they feel that success when they get to 10 much better or in a different way than if it's just like, oh, yeah, okay, you got, I, th I think that's good enough. You know, <laughs> it's, yes, you, you hit the, the criteria. So having that concrete way of providing feedback to parents, I think is really, really uh, Im important. And we'll take questions at the end. Okay. Um, now, most of the codes that we're going to talk about really correspond with the, the do skills that we ask of in parents in CDI or the don't skills. Okay, so they, they do correspond. There's not a 100% correspondence, and actually the DPICs have been used to um, assess parent-child interactions outside of PCIT as well, and in, in studies using the Incredible Years or other programs, we'll use the DPICs occasionally as well. So it doesn't, uh, it's not married to PCIT. Um, so when do we code? For clinical purposes, we're gonna code at pretreatment and post-treatment. And in those situations, that's kind of a, I call it the full-blown DPICS assessment. We do three situations, and it takes about 20 minutes per parent. Um, and we look at them in, 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 uh, in, uh, in more detail. In each of the coaching sessions, we do five minutes of CDI coaching to determine our coaching goals. And then before in PDI, um, in most PDI uh, sessions, you do five minutes of PDI coding and then you do five minutes of CDI coding, and your session guidelines will guide you in terms of which sessions you do which kinds of coding. Um, but it, it's all, in just about every session, you're doing some coding to look at where the parent skills are at so you know where you're going that week. Okay. Now, in the, in the full-blown DPIX assessment um, that's done at pretreatment and post-treatment, there's three coding situations. The first one is low demand, where you tell the parent, to let the child lead the play and the parent is just to follow along with the parent or follow along with the child. Um, and um, they do that for five minutes while you relax. Maybe you're scoring your FB, maybe you are filling out your forms, getting them ready for coding. Um, just to kind of let them warm up to the situation, let the child warm up to the situation, um, let the parent warm up to the fact that they have a therapist watching them while they're playing with their child uh, with, you know, kind of, um, ambiguous uh, uh, directions. Um, so in the low demand situation, we, we uh, give the parents uh, and the child five minutes of kind of warm up time before we start coding. Then we give the parent the instruction and say, you know, we're halfway through this situation, please continue to let your child lead the play. 
and then we watch them for five minutes. And during that five minutes, we're using the coding sheets uh, similar to what's in front of you and just keeping a tally. Every, for each parent verbalization, we'll mark it in a coding category, okay? Um, and we do that for another five minutes. Then we, we give parents the instruction that they are to lead the play and they are to choose an activity and get their child to play with them according to their rules. Um, and then again, we watch and observe and code for five minutes. They don't get a warm up in that situation. Um, and then finally, and, and when the parent leads the play, that's a little bit higher demand. Um, you know, it's, it's oftentimes easy for kids, even kids with disruptive behavior, to do a pretty good job when they're in control and they're doing what they want to do. Um, and the parent's not trying to lead them. Once the parent says, oh, hey, I want to play with the blocks, and maybe the child doesn't want to play with the blocks, then you can start to see some of that conflict come in um, on occasion. Um, and then we, we up the ante a little bit more, and we institute the high demand uh, situation where the parent is told to tell the child that they have to clean up all of the toys, um, put them all in their containers, and put all the containers in the toy box um, by themselves. And I've had plenty of kids say, but mom, you played with them too. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the idea there is that that's the highest demand. A lot of kids would, would uh, be oppositional when given that direction. And we want to see what the, the kid is like in that situation. We want to see what the parent is like in that situation. So again, we give the parent the instruction to have the kid clean up the toys. And then they um, are able to, we're watching and we're coding what goes on from that point. Um, and whenever during the, the pre-treatment assessment, you can kind of get the gamut of, of responses from the parent and from the child. Um, you know, sometimes it's like the, 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 um, the car that you take into the mechanic that's been making a noise for two weeks. You show up at the mechanics and it stops. Sometimes kids will do that. They will come into the clinic and they will just be angels. <laughs> you know, they're, thank you, yes, ma'am, thank you, please. You know, just using their best manners and just makes it hard to believe that they are the, the terrors that their parents describe them as. Um, but we know different, <laughs> we know lots of kids that, that will show up and do well. And what I tell parents there is that's really great that we can see what they're capable of and see their best behavior. We know what we're working for and we know what we just need to bring out in them more and more often. Sometimes kids will show the other side of things and they will really act out and they will really have a hard time with it. Um, and parents will really have a hard time with it. Um, and in those cases, I tell parents, you know, I'm really glad that I got a chance to see what you're, you're dealing with. Um, and I can really understand why he'd be so challenging. He'd be challenging for anybody um, with that kind of behavior. And so however the observation goes, I think it gives us really good information as clinicians. And it's always really important to give parents that feedback as to how it goes and, um, you know, let them know, again, kind of however it goes, you want to let them know that it went how it's supposed to go. Um, and that's to give you an opportunity to see what it's like. Um, and it can be really nerve wracking for parents. Um, so I think just reassuring them, you know, this is something I do with all the families that I work with. It's not that I'm singling you out because I think that there's something terribly wrong with the way that you interact with your child. Um, it's not that, um, you know, if he totally acts out, like Melanie was saying, you know, if a child does completely destroy the room or, you know, something like that, it, to the parent, it's like, it's just another day at the office for me. <laughs> this is what happens. So um, reassuring them that, that these are things that... that we are used to and, and, and can deal with and, and that they're in the right place um, that, the, um, that we can help. Um, in terms of setting up the observation, you're going to set up kind of, you're going to set up your room similar to a, a PCIT session. You want to have a table and some chairs. You want to have toys and the toys that you pick out are going to be the same sorts of toys that you pick out for PCIT. Um, and then you, you want to have the, the bug in the ear um, if that's available so that you can give the parent the instructions for the interaction without the child overhearing. Um, it's really awful, even sometimes over the bug in the ear, the child will hear what's going on and the, the clinician will say, tell the child to clean up the toys and the, the child will overhear that and just go ahead and start cleaning up the toys. It kind of misses the point of the observation. Um, in terms of the in-session observations, there what we do is we usually give the caregiver a cue to start. This is at our, in our session. We've greeted the parent. We've gotten the FB and their homework sheets from them. We've gone over our homework. We're getting ready to, to coach. We go behind the mirror and we give them a, a cue to start to say, okay, you can let them know it's your special time and you can, uh, they can play with whatever they want. Um, and then we code for five minutes, okay? Again, using the sheets that you're looking at to keep tally of the different things that the parent says. 
Um, from that, we, we are able to choose our coaching focus. Um, so if they are really good, good on labeled praises, that's probably not going to be our coaching focus. That wouldn't make sense. They're already good at that. We pick something that, that, that they're weaker on. Um, and then we give the caregivers some brief feedback. Oh, you did really great with your label praises today. And you were really watching your questions, I could tell. But we're going to work on those behavior descriptions. So I want you to describe what he's doing and go from there. Okay? And then and go, into, go into the coaching. So are you guys ready for some basic coding rules? Are you ready for some basic coding rules? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it all, uh, you know, I, there are a lot of rules. Um, it, the rules is used there on purpose, but um, it, it, it's, it is an exercise sometimes in terms of parsing things apart and figuring out which code it could be. And it can be a mental exercise, but I kind of like it for that reason. I kind of like the fact that it is an exercise for your brain. Um, you know, I really do think it's like Sudoku or crossword puzzles or other kind of nerdy things that people might do. <laughs> <laughs> because it, it works your brain and, and it but what have crossword puzzles been shown to do they they help uh your brain stay young and functioning and sharp and i think that that's a great thing so dpix can do that for you guys too if, if any of you are getting older like i am that's something you're worried about and so doing dpix every day um is certainly my plan for staying young and and uh reasonably with it so the basic coding rules is that one behavior, one verbalization is only going to be coded into one category. So the basic rule is that whenever the parent says something, you make a tally mark in one of the boxes, in one of the categories. Um, and then the next time they say something, you make another tally mark. And so it's just a tally mark each time they say something. Um, in order for verbalizations to count, they have to be directed at the other person. So in order for parent verbalizations to count, they have to be directed at the child. Sometimes the parents will say things um, for example, like oops, you know, they'll be like oops, and it's not even like loud enough for the child to hear, and it's to themselves. That doesn't have to be coded, or they'll say, you know, this thing isn't working. I can't hear anything. <laughs> that's obviously not to the child. That's to you as the, the coach. So you don't have to code that. Um, other things that are not coded are going to be any kind of random noises or sound effects, and this is good. Um, trust us, because there have been times when we've tried to code those things. And it's enough to drive you crazy. Uh, because what's the difference between zoom and zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
can you, which would change how you would code the rest of the, the verbalization, and you distribute that from one thing to another. I'll give you a better example. The parent might say, I like the way you're sitting in your chair and paying attention to this really interesting talk. Okay? That's one sentence. But we're going to code that as two verbalizations, because there's two behaviors there that they're praising. But we're also going to distribute that. I like the way you're, so we're going to code it as I like the way you're sitting in your seat, and I like the way that you're paying attention. Okay, so it gets coded as two verbalizations, and it's going to be coded as two praises that way. Okay? Um, it's, the, the rule is also that yes and no are always coded as their own verbalization. That was done purely for convenience <laughs> because otherwise it gets really hard to know if yes is included in a verbalization or if it's on its own. So the decision was made that it's always on its own. So if you hear the parents say, yeah, okay, sure, no, nope, uh-uh, all those things are going to be coded uh, on their own, okay? Um, and then timeout. If a child happens to go to timeout while you're coding, you just cease to code for the duration of the timeout. From the time the parent puts them in the chair, then you stop and you resume coding. So if you have five minutes and a timeout happens at three and a half minutes in, you pause for however long the timeout takes, and then you resume for another minute and a half to make up your full five minutes of coding. Okay? It doesn't happen very often. A lot of times at pretreatment, parents aren't really using timeout um, because it hasn't been working for them, um, or they're just not sure if they're supposed to in that situation. Um, and by the end of treatment, hopefully, the child doesn't really need timeout. So um, it works out pretty well. Okay, so moving into our category. This is the fun part. Negative talk. Let's start with the, the good stuff, right? Negative talk goes along with the don't skill of criticizing um, or telling the child to not do something, to quit. Um, and it's any kind of verbal expression of disapproval of what the child's doing, how the child is, anything like that. It's also anything that's sassy or impudent or rude. And what I always tell people is if it sounds bad, it's negative talk. You know, if you just kind of have that, that, that reaction to it of like, oh, that was not a nice thing for the parent to say, it's negative talk, okay? Um, and what it also, anytime the parent disagrees with the child or, or contradicts is a better term. If they contradict what the child has said, then it's going to be coded as negative, negative talk as well. Um, and anytime they say don't or quit, um, those sorts of things um, are likely to get coded negative talk. Now, the, 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 sometimes parents, or not parents, but coders will say, well, you know, it, it, it sounds really bad to code negative talk on a parent. They feel a little guilty for, for coding a parent. You know, they could be a very nice parent and have a negative talk. Um, most parents will have a negative talk or two. It's okay. You don't have to feel guilty about that. Um, it, it's, it's part of the program. So um, if they say, you know, they can say, you know, that doesn't go like that sugar pumpkin, sweet spice sort of, you know, whatever. <laughs> they can see it in the sweetest possible way. It's still going to be a negative talk, okay? So examples, that's a little sloppy. Don't do that. Stop yelling at me. That's not yellow. Um, how many times have I told you not to do that? Um, well, that was smart. Um, you can't make me, and why should I? Okay, commands. Commands are another category that falls into our, our, don't, uh, our don't skills. Um, we don't want parents giving commands. Um, but the idea there is that there are directions from one person to another that indicate that the, the parent um, or the child is to do something. Um, there has to be a verb included in there. Um, and it can be a clear command, like sit down, or it can be something more vague, like can you hand me that, that crayon? Okay. So some more examples, hand me the round block, please sit in this chair, hold my hand. You need to pick up the block that fell. Those are the pretty clear commands. Um, would you bring me that doll? How about you take a seat? Um, let's build a tower with blocks. When you include kind of that, you can use that royal we and it can still be a command. Um, and you can make a fence with that piece. So those sorts of things get at telling the child to do something, whether they're telling them very clearly it has to be done or they're making the suggestion that it could be done or should be done. Okay. Praise. Now we're moving into the do skills, right? 
Um, so praise is any kind of positive evaluation of the child's behavior, activity, or products. And, and we're going to be specific about this, and we're specific about it with parents as well. We want them to be giving labeled praises rather than unlabeled praises. And so by labeled praises, we mean praises that are very specific. Um, so we want to say things like, um, you're doing a great job sitting in your chair. Um, or I really like the colors that you picked out for that picture. Um, or good manners, something that tells them they're doing well and what it is that they're doing well. Um, unlabeled praises are the, the more vague sorts of things where the child doesn't know exactly what it is maybe that they're being praised for. Like, good job, way to go, good girl. Those sorts of praises are unlabeled praises. Um, sometimes the, the line gets a little blurry in terms of what counts as specific enough to be a labeled praise versus an unlabeled praise. Um, things, some of the, like good work. Good work sounds almost like a label praise because there's work, but what is work exactly? So good work is still considered an unlabeled praise. Um, good idea, same thing. Um, just too vague to be a, to be a label praise. Um, but so other, I, um, so between label praise and unlabeled praise, you are using wonderful colors in that picture. What is that? Labeled, labeled absolutely. Good girl. Unlabeled, very good. Thank you for sharing. Labeled, absolutely. That's kind of the prototypical label praise right there. Thank you for sharing. Okay. So there's also questions, right? Um, parents can ask questions. Parents usually do ask a lot of questions before we work with them and, and try and get them to eliminate the questions from what they're saying. Um, that's going to be things that are who, what, when, why, where sorts of questions. But it's also going to be anything that has a rising intonation to it. So if the, the uh, parent says, um, oh, you're building a tower over there? That's going to be a question, right? Versus you're building a tower over there. Um, and so we need to, as coaches, we listen for that and we code that as a question. And as coaches, we will coach them to try and get rid of that rising intonation to suggest it's a question. And a lot of times when parents do that, They'll say, well, I don't even realize that I'm asking a question. But you'll hear the child say, yeah, because they heard it as a question. And if they're hearing it as a question, it counts as a question. I mean, it counts as a question regardless. So um, are you going to use the yellow crayon question? What color is your favorite question? You're putting the eyes on question. That's a blue one, isn't it? Question. A lot of times parents will ruin a perfectly good statement by adding, huh, at the end, or isn't it, or aren't you? Um, and um, as parents are, are learning to avoid the questions, you almost see them jump when they ask one because they're like, oh, that was a question. And uh, I have to convince people we don't have the electric buzzers under the seats because it certainly <laughs> looks that way. OK, so reflections. Reflections are another one of our do skills. These are things that we want parents to be doing. Um, and that's just saying what the child has said. Um, and it should include some of the child's words or synonyms thereof. There needs to be a pretty good correspondence between what the child has said and what the parent has said. You can paraphrase or elaborate, but it shouldn't be changing the meaning of what the, the child has said. Okay, so the, the child says, I like the color blue, and the parent says, you are really fascinated with the combination of green and yellow. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> I like blue would do just fine. Or another one where, you know, the child just says, man, I'm tired. And the parent says, you are so worn out because you were running around all day today and you were driving me crazy. <laughs> That's going to be too much to be just the reflection. <laughs> so some good examples are going to be the child says, I like these yellow blocks. And the parent says, you like the yellow blocks. Can somebody give me another reflection for that? Sounds like. Sounds like you like the yellow blocks. You can say it that way. Um, yellow blocks. Exactly. It could just be yellow blocks. Oh, yellow. Okay. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't have to be the whole thing. And younger kids are much more forgiving of, of parroting than older kids. You get a five or six year old, they're going to be like, yeah, I just said I like the yellow blocks. <laughs> you know, <laughs> or why are you copying me? Um, so it, it could just be something as simple as, as yellow blocks. How about um, the child here says it's a banana. The parent parrot said it is a banana and then elaborates, just like the one you had for breakfast. Okay, so that doesn't change the meaning of what the, the, the child has said, it just elaborates on it a little bit. Um, and then one of my favorites is the child says, Can we go to McDonald's? 
and the parent maybe doesn't want to answer the question because the answer is no, <laughs> we're not going to McDonald's. Um, so they just say, you're wondering if we can go to McDonald's. Now that's, that's not always the best approach because <laughs> sometimes kids will say, what's two and two? Or what does two plus two make? And the parent is like, you're wondering what two plus two makes. <laughs> and the child's like, yeah, I want to know. And the parent's like, you really want to know what two and two makes. <laughs> So it's, it's okay, too, to just answer the question. Um, but you can reflect a question if you need to. Okay, so moving on to behavioral descriptions. Behavioral descriptions satisfy the describe uh, um, rule of, of PCIT. Um, and so when parents are describing what the child is doing, they're describing their behavior, their behavioral descriptions. Okay. Um, and what they do is they describe the child's observable behavior, and it has to have a noun verb phrase where the subject is the child. Um, the verb describes the child's ongoing or just completed behavior and uses an action verb. Using an action verb is kind of a, a, a sticking point. Um, the child has to be doing something in order for it to count as a behavior description. So things just like, you have blue eyes, not a behavior description. You have an orange crayon not a behavior description. You're using an orange crayon, you're coloring with the orange crayon, you're throwing the orange crayon. Those would all be behavior descriptions. The last one, not a good behavior description. You don't want to describe things that you don't want the child doing, but it needs to have that action to it um, to be counted as a behavior description. So examples, you're putting the blue block on top of the yellow one, you're digging through the Legos, that's a tall tower you're building. You built a wall out of blue blocks. You're coloring a puppy, and you are using the green crayon. So all of those things um, are considered behavior descriptions. Now, you'll notice that this one here, that's a tall tower you are building, is in a different kind of format. And that's actually a new rule for the DPEGs, that this still counts as a behavior description. Because what we figured out is that all of our behavior descriptions were taking the form of, you are doing this, and you are doing that, and now you are doing this. And it was getting a little repetitious. <laughs> And so now switching up the format of it just a little bit. So there's still the, the child is a subject here, and there's the action verb, still considered part of the, the verbalization and gets coded as a behavior description. Okay. Talk. Talk. Talk gets underestimated sometimes because talk is kind of the category for all the things that don't fall into any of the other categories. It's kind of the miscellaneous category. Um, and it includes anything that, that introduces information or indicates attention to the child. Um, it can be things like, that's a blue block, okay, I think I'll make a tower. A red one is over there, his name is Diego, this is fun. So those sorts of things can be talk. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, we even considered getting rid of the category of talk because, you know, well, what does it tell us? It, and what we realize that it tells us is that it's really nice to know how much the parent is talking because there is a big difference between the parent who has, you know, maybe two behavior descriptions, two reflections, two labeled praises, and no talk versus the parent who has 27 talks, two behavior descriptions, two reflections, two labeled praises. Um, and the way that you coach those parents would be very different. Um, so it, talk is a very important category, and I think the talk sometimes, for, especially for new coders, kind of goes over our heads because it doesn't light up you know, our, our brains the way that, oh, that's a label praise, or oh, that's a reflection. Those are things that I'm looking for. Um, talk doesn't necessarily do that, so I think that the biggest thing is to get in the habit of each time the parent says something, you're making a mark, okay? And that way you'll get your talks in. So there's a couple codes that we use only at pre-treatment and post-treatment um, because we really want to look at child compliance at pre-treatment and post-treatment. That's a big goal of PCIT, right, is to improve child compliance. And we need a good measure of that, a good observational measure of that at pre-treatment and post-treatment. Um, so the direct command, um, remember during session we're going to code commands. Um, during pre-treatment and post-treatment we're going to be a little bit more specific. We're going to code direct commands which is an order or direction that it's clear, it's mandatory, it's sit down, put the toys away, be quiet, give me the red one, write your name on the paper, very clear that the child is to do it and it's to be done. It's not, there's no wiggle room there at all. Indirect commands are the commands where there's more wiggle room, like it's more of a suggestion that the child do it or it's not clear if the child has to do it or not. Um, so things that 
um, are put in question form or use that royal we, like whenever the, the parent says, let's clean up the toys, that's going to be an indirect command. Okay. And then we also want to look at how the child responds. Do they comply or do they not comply? And, and the way that we do that is we consider the five second interval after the command. Okay, so the command is given, sit down. As a coder in my head, I'm thinking 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. Is the child sitting in their chair? Um, and that, um, if they were sitting in their chair, it's coded as compliance. If they are not sitting in their chair, it is not non-compliance. If for some reason the parent doesn't give them a chance to comply with that, say they say sit down and then say, no, wait, go over there and do something different, then that's going to be no opportunity to comply. Okay. Um, no opportunity to comply is coded a lot more often than you would think um, because parents aren't giving necessarily very well thought out commands or just giving commands very often so the child doesn't have that five second interval to comply. Okay? Um, and it could also be that they, they're saying things that where there's really no way for us to know if the child is complying or not, like pay attention, listen up. Those are coded as no opportunity to comply because we have no opportunity to code whether or not they complied because um, we, we just can't tell if they're doing those things. Things too, like calling the child's name um, can make a big difference. You know, say Jennifer is going to be um, uh, an indirect command um, and we're going to look at, um, they, they, there's no way for us to know if they respond to that. So it's coded as no opportunity to comply. Okay. And then like when we're done here, you'll need to put your shoes back on. That's a command because they're telling them to put their shoes on, but they're not going to do it in that five second interval. So there's no opportunity to comply with that. Okay. Now, priority order. This is fun because sometimes there will be statements that the parent will say that will fall into more than one category. The, child, the parent might say, uh, for example, that the child says, I'm building a tower, and the parent says, you're building a tower. What two categories does that fall under? Reflection, reflection is one, yep. What's the other one? Behavior. Perfect, yes. It, it falls under both reflection solidly and behavior description solidly. So we use the priority order to make sure that we all choose the same one when that happens. And so we choose the one that comes first in the list. So if it is both a reflection and a behavior description, what are we going to code it? Reflection, perfect. If something is both a question and a, and a command, well, that's not a good one. Um, <clears throat> if something's both a reflection and a command, what does it get coded? Command. command, yes, which is tricky and sometimes doesn't feel so good to code it that way, but that is how it gets coded. The, the child will say, let's play together, and the parent will say, let's play together, and you have to code it as a command because that's the rule. Um, how you coach it could be a different story, but how you code it, it should always be the same. Decision rules order happens when you are just not sure. You don't know between two categories um, how things are, are supposed to go. Sometimes it'll go where parents will say something that sounds like it could be something positive, like, you know, that drawing is really whacked or something like that. I'm not very good with my slang, but, you know, it's like... <laughs> I think I heard that that was a good thing. The parent is smiling, but in general, whacked doesn't mean a good thing to me. So maybe I'm not sure, and I can go to my decision rules order to decide. Or sometimes I'll use my decision rules order when I can't hear it very good, and I'm not 100% sure if they said, said it one way, which would make it one code, or said it a different way to make it another code. Um, I'll go ahead and, and use my decision rules order to make that decision for me. In live coding, because in live coding, Things are moving fast, and you can't really spend a lot of time to, to um, always figure out exactly which way it should go. You don't have the luxury of rewinding um, and listening to it again. So you make the best choice. And the decision rules order and the priority order are here so that we can all code reliably together. Inter-rater reliability is a big um, deal for, for DPIX, and for a, a system like this, it can be really hard to get all of us to agree most of the time on how things should be coded because parents say all kinds of stuff. Um, and so the decision rules order and the priority order are there to help us make those decisions in the same way. So if we're not sure, we always err on one side. If we're sure that it falls into two categories, we err 
the other way around. And since one is the direct opposite of the other, it should balance it out um, over time. OK. And now, before we get to the practice, the other thing to, to think about is that we, when we talk about ZPIX coding, what we want for, for PCIT therapists is to achieve 80% reliability with a master coder. Um, and so that means that you are agreeing with them 80% of the time. It's not 100%. It's not even 90%. Um, because that can be really hard to do, just in differences in what you hear, um, differences in, in opinion of how things come out. It, you know, 80% is, is, is a challenge, but it's absolutely um, achievable, whereas 100%, we're never going to agree 100%. Um, try as we might. <laughs> I, I don't know that I've ever achieved 100% except in one coding situation where five minutes long, the parents said one thing, and me and my co-therapist coded it the exact same way. <laughs> and we celebrated our 100% iterator reliability. But um, So the, the goal with all of this is not going to be that we agree 100% of the time. It's going to be agreed that we agree at least 80% of the time. So with, when we code things, there's a lot of room for discussion. How do you think that it should go? Which, you know, sometimes people will have one good rationale for one code and another good rationale for a different code. And in training, it's important, I think, to talk about those things so that those guidelines become more familiar and they become more natural for you. So when you are coding live, it's a lot easier um, for the, those guidelines to come to your mind when you need them. In live coding, you're going to do the best you can. Um, so the more we practice, the better and easier the live coding will be. Okay, so practice. Thank you for doing what I asked. Say it loud. Louder. <laughs> yes, label praise. <laughs> so what that has the components of a label praise, right? It says thank you, so that's a positive evaluation, and then for doing what I asked is a specific behavior. Good. You're making a fort. Behavior yes, behavior description. Yeah, if the child had just said, I'm making a fort, it could be a reflection. Uh, but just on its own, it's, it's a, a behavior description because it has the action verb and the child is the subject. And it's talking about what the child is doing right now, Okay, the ongoing behavior. That's great. Yes. <laughs> that was wonderful volume there. I, I like that confidence. Isn't that a fabulous sun you drew? Question, yes. Anybody see anything else in there? It, I, I can see behavior description in there too. There's a you drew in there. Um, label praise, yeah. So to me, it is both a question, obviously, there's a question mark at the end. Um, two, it is a label praise. So what are we going to do? It is both of those things. Which, which list are we going to look at? Priority order. Very good. So let's go back to our priority order real quick. And so label praise comes before question and gets coded as a label praise. Okay. Very good. You are so creative. Unlabeled. Very good. I tried to trick you with that one. But there's not really a, 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 a specificity there. What are they created for? Um, it, we don't know. So just to say you are so creative is an unlabeled praise. Very good. We need to clean up now. It's in, in the clinical version, it's a command. In uh, pre and post treatment, it is going to be an indirect command. Why is it indirect? I, oh, I think I heard it. It's because of the we. Um, when the parent uses that, that royal we, that's going to make it an indirect command. If they say you need to clean up now, what would it be? Direct. Direct. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, so now the, the parent says, yeah, that one is blue. And? This one's a tricky one, too. I heard a neutral talk in there. The, the trick here is that yes and no are always what? Coded on their own. So we need one code for yes, and then another code for that one is blue. 
So you guys told me reflection for that one is blue. Yes would be. It, it's just coded as a talk. Yeah. OK, so yes is a talk. And then that one is blue is the reflection. OK. Where is that car going? Question. Absolutely. Very good. That's not where that goes. Very good. Negative talk. Where does it go? Question. Good. Why don't you put that one over here? Very good. Thought I'd get you with a couple questions in there. No, it's, it's a command, even though it's in question form. I'm um, telling the child to put it over there. I like how you figured out where to put that one. Label praise. Awesome. See, you guys are really catching on to that. And most of them fall in line with the do's and the don'ts of what we're asking parents to do. And most of the time, they make pretty good sense. Is that what you're supposed to be doing? Negative, Negative talk, yes. Especially if you put some tone into it. <laughs> OK. So now this is going to be the fun part. I've never really done this quite this way before. So we'll see how it goes. Um, but I was thinking, you know, for me to, to come up with quotes like, you know, thank you for doing what I asked, kind of boring. So. Um, I don't know about you, but and maybe my other master trainers do the same thing as me, but I, I can be watching TV and I will start coding. I can be in a movie and I will start coding. I can be talking over the phone to a friend and I will start coding. And so I, I want to share that obsession with you, <laughs> is what I'm saying. Um, so I have some famous movie quotes and we're going to see if we can code these. Okay? Go ahead, make my day. I'm not doing the impressions. Keep in mind, <laughs> that's, that's too much. <laughs> Go ahead, make my day. I, that's a good, I, can, I, I see a, a case for that. I myself thought about commands, two commands. Go ahead, make my day. Neither one of which would have opportunity for compliance, right? <laughs> I don't know if they're making his day or not. <laughs> Um, I, I think that there could be an argument for um, negative talk. If, 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 uh, if my impression was more on, <laughs> you might hear the tone in it. Um, but I think that the, the, the way that it is there, um, I would go with uh, two direct commands. You talking to me? Question. Question. Very good. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Negative talk. Yes, that's the negative talk. <laughs> Um, I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Oh. Neutral talk. Yeah, I'd probably go with neutral talk. It, it, they're saying something positive, but I don't think that the other person in that interaction had anything to do with the napalm in the morning. So um, it's, not a, it's not a praise. It's just a talk. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Comment description. Comment description. Fasten your seatbelts. What is that going to be? Command. command. Absolutely. Nice, clear, direct command, right? What about it's going to be a bumpy ride? I'd go with neutral talk. Yeah. Um, they're not saying, you know, that the, the, the other person has to do anything there. They're just saying, this is how it's going to be. Show me the money. Direct command. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we got a few more. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? I'm good at this, aren't I? Uh, so let's start with you've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? That's a tough one, isn't it? I'd say command. Yeah, even though there's kind of a question in the no. command, um, I, I think that, that it's not asking the question, it's, it's quoting the question. So you've got to ask yourself one question. That's going to be a, a command. Is it direct command or indirect command? Direct. 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 You've got to. You have to. It's not, it's not optional. OK. Well, do you, punk? 
the punk, yeah, the punk might make a negative talk. Um, if I remember Quinn's delivery, there was a little attitude there. Um, so it could, it, in just looking at it written out, I'd say question, but the tone can make a difference in terms of, of um, I don't know, how many of you think that, that calling somebody a punk would be worthy of negative talk? Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Let's go with negative talk on that one. I, I think if somebody called me a punk, I'd be kind of ear, you know, kind of like, well, that's not nice. <laughs> so negative talk. Good job. I like the way you, that you're thinking, and that's exactly how we want you to think about these codes. Is think about what it's like. Think about what sorts of uh, guidelines it can fall under, and then pick the best one. Um, and, and like I said, in training, we work a lot on really trying to figure out which one's best. When you're doing live coding, then hopefully those guidelines will come back to you more and more naturally. Yo, Adrian. <laughs> yes! Who did that? <laughs> Bonus points for you. Did you hear her answer? No, she said no. indirect command, no opportunity to comply. That is absolutely correct. It is indirect because it, it's just saying the name. You know, when, when people use the name that way, they're saying, look at me or pay attention or something along those lines. Um, and so it's, it's, it's coded as an indirect command. Parents do use that a lot of the time to get children's attention. And it's always no opportunity to comply. So very, very well done with that answer. Loved it. Thank you for the piece of the <laughs> <laughs> Carpe diem. Seize the day, boys. Make your lives extraordinary. I, I must admit, I had a dilemma with this one. My dilemma was, this is not in English. <laughs> now I know what it means. <laughs> but if I didn't know what it means, I'd be up, well, you know, I'd be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, so do we code it based on what we know it means? Yeah, I think in this case it's safe to, to go ahead and code it based on what we know it means. If you're not sure what it means, um, then you know you're going to do the best you can. You might have to skip it or, or go to your decision rules or something. But carpe diem means seize the day, seize the day, boys. So that's going to be two direct commands with no opportunity to comply. Again, we're not going to be sure if they're seizing the day in the next five seconds. Okay. Um, make your lives extraordinary. What's that going to be? Same thing. Direct command, no opportunity to comply. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. That comes up a lot. The fact that a command is direct versus indirect has to do with the, the mandatory nature of the command. Does is it have to be done or is it could be done? Um, you know, if something's optional, it's indirect. Uh, if it's vague, it can still be direct. But what you're getting at, which is a really good thing to get at, is those vague commands like these are always going to be no opportunity to comply for exactly the reason you said. Because we can't know if they're doing it. Yeah. Uh, going back to the carpe diem thing, if you understand it, but you can tell the child doesn't, and to them it's just babble, should it just be neutral talk? If you know that the child does not even understand that as a command? No, I think that you would still code it based on what the parent said. Um, just because parents a lot of times will use words and things that kids don't necessarily understand. I think that it would be kind of a slippery slope for me as a coder to try and figure out what is the child understanding in, in each situation. So I'd go ahead and code it based on what the parents said. But that's a great question. It's relevant for giving commands. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in situations like this where it's like kind of vague, and to, to me it just seems like they're talking, like if the parent says, OK, have fun, Amanda, and it's just like they're saying have fun, it's not like a yeah. command to have fun. It's still coded as a command. It's still coded as a command. Yeah. And again, part of that is so that we can all code it the same way every time. When you start talking about context and intention, you know, like sometimes parents will say, well, the parent didn't mean that to be a command. They didn't intend for that to be a command. And that makes it really hard for all of us to agree on what the parent intended. It makes it a little bit more fuzzy. Um, if we're all going based, you know, most of the time on what they say, 
then we're gonna we're gonna code it the same way. So, but it, what that brings up a good point. There'll be times when you code things and you won't like the way you have to code them. Okay, I'll be honest with you. You will cringe, but you will, if you're listening to me, you will mark it down, like with negative talk. Like there are times a child goes under the table to pick up a toy that fell. The parent says, sugar, please don't bump your head on the way up. That's still a negative talk because they're telling the child what not to do, okay? I don't like it. It makes me feel oogie to code them as a negative talk for that because that's exactly what I would say. Well, maybe not the, the well, maybe it is exactly what I would say. Um, and uh, so it makes me feel bad to put down negative talk, but I still do so that we all code it the same way each time. Um, and we maintain that reliability. Now when I'm coaching, how I interpret that data is going to vary, right? And so that's when I would say, if that's the only command that the, ga the parent gave during my observation, am I going to coach them and say, we really need to work on you avoiding commands? No, absolutely not. Um, but if it, uh, you know, if it, if that was a, a command that was in, in the course of a whole bunch of other commands, then maybe so. Okay. I have a question here. Yeah. This, this uh, coding is formed, serves as the, like the note for the session? Or no, that's still just, write a note you still write a note on, okay. in addition to so that. Yeah. Hold on, let me get through these examples and then we'll open it up for questions, okay? We're, We're just about out of time? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. I'll get you my pretty and your little dog too. Negative, negative, negative talk. Negative. Very good. You're gonna need a bigger boat. Negative. See, to me that one's that one's tricky. I think that that one's just talk, because it's not telling them to actually do anything. It's not saying you need to go get a bigger boat. It's just you're gonna need a bigger boat. So to me that one's talk. What I was amazed at is I looked and I looked and I looked. I could not find a reflection, <laughs> and I, I don't think that I found a labeled praise anyway. So uh, movies tend to, to not, they're, they're a lot better for negative talk, questions, and commands. If you're looking for those, that's the place to look. Okay, so uh, questions. Yes. I think that that's a no opportunity to comply command. Okay. Um, so th it would still get coded as a command, but then there's no opportunity to comply because you don't know if they should or if they shouldn't. So it's just a bad command. Yeah. Um, what I'm going to do since we are over time is go ahead and let you guys have your break. Um, and then anybody that has other questions can come up and talk to me.